to our film, Michael Stobar.
befriends the creature, an amphibian man, and takes him home. And I thought that's the, that's the way into the story, because uh, first of all, I think, uh, I happen to believe that fantasy is, whether you articulate it or not, the most political genre we have, and the one that can allow you to do abstractions and parables and so forth. And I thought, instead of going through the front door with the alpha males, I'm going to go through the service entrance with the people that clean. And that already twists everything on its head, you know, to turn everything on its head. And that was uh, the point into telling a story about empathy with the other, and about people without a voice, invisible people, coming together and sticking it to the man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Dr. Jones, this is your, your uh, I'm going to count six movies now. Is that right? Yes, with this gentleman, yeah. Six movies, so... Legal movies. Well, that's me, I mean, so, <laughs> oh boy, I mean, uh, Golden Army, uh, and obviously Pan's Labyrinth, which is just a masterpiece film. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, like, this film comes along for you, and, like, what was it about the story when you read the screenplay, or maybe when you first heard about it, that, that it felt like it was going to be different and special? Mm. Uh, well, I, it was a verbal telling I, at Guillermo's office up in Toronto. We were working on Crimson Peak at the time. I was two of his ghost ladies in that. <laughs> and uh, on a day off, I was called into his office uh, for, during lunchtime for him to close the door and tell me this little private story uh, that he wanted to do next, and he wanted me to play the creature in it. And I thought, well, surprise. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he said, this is, you know, but this is different. Uh, uh, you're going to be the romantic leading man of this movie. Wow. Uh, yeah, there's a challenge there in a fish suit. So, um, so I, uh, I knew that this meant something personal to him. Because I knew of his love of the uh, universal monsters, and especially the creature from the Black Lagoon. And yeah. that whole story he just told, I, I had knew, knew that from before. So I knew this was a very dear project to his heart. And uh, that meant that I, uh, I needed to buckle down and, and do my job. What he said to me was, uh, I, don't want, I don't want a Dougie Jones performance. And he gave me the hands. <laughs> he said, I really want you to connect heart to heart, soul to soul with Sally Hawkins. Oh my gosh, Sally Hawkins? <laughs> Uh, so that's what made the job much easier was um, was and more real was uh, was working opposite of a, a magician like her an angel like Sally Hawkins. Um, we had dance rehearsal for three weeks before we started filming. Dance rehearsal, okay. I got to do an MGM musical, you guys. It was awesome. On flippers, in flippers, yes. <laughs> Not how I pictured it as a kid, but um, but. Uh, during that rehearsal time, we not only learned choreography and, and dance steps, but we learned about each other. I mean, we had a lot of quiet time together, we laughed together, we cried together, we told secrets and insecurities and, and shared all of that together. And uh, I'm, I'm terrified, are you terrified? Yes, me too. Good, we have each other's back. You know, that kind of trust and, and, uh, and deep affection for each other built. So that by the time the cameras rolled, hopefully that came across as some chemistry on the film. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. So, uh, and, and the other note, was, um, was uh, uh, even though it seems like I'm an animal from the wild, I'm not. Uh, I was worshipped as a god, as, as was referred to in the, in the Amazon. Yeah. And so uh, Guillermo's notes were about, with the stature and the, and the carriage of this, of this character, to, to channel some, some, something uh, regal and something, something godlike. And, uh, and he said, throw in some matador, lead with the hips, be sexy. <laughs> okay, got it. Got it. <laughs> and so I, I did my best, you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> Michael, what kind of background did you get on Dr. Robert? Or it was it was a little more than just like a, like a little synopsis. Like you, you had a whole backstory written, written about this guy. Well, that was kind of one of the singular experiences working with Guillermo was that uh, he loves these characters so much that he kept writing for them. <laughs> so on the first day, he handed me a full on, like four or five page biography of where this guy was from, uh, uh, what his trajectory was to get to the beginning of this story, what his favorite foods were, what, what books he had read, all this wonderful stuff that we 
tried to find places to put it in, but it was really just sort of the soul of who this man was. The irony on his pants. What's that? That came from the biography. You were ironing the pants. Ironing the pants yeah. that day. I think. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I took that and I, 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 I ran with it. And uh, but it was, you know, I, I had never had that kind of an experience before. It was wonderful. It was just wonderful. You know, this is a film that represents. It's it's all about fusion. Fusion in a lot of ways because obviously you have Beauty and the Beast. Fusion there, but. This, there's a lot of fusion going on with different film styles. How did you sort of like keep the balance going? Well, I think the, the, the thing that is invisible and maybe to, to inside baseball for most people, but the most difficult thing on a movie, the most intangible is tone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's one of the hardest things to achieve. And when the ambition of this movie was to make it a love letter about love, but a love letter to cinema, to proper, good, uh, God-given cinema. <laughs> and you know, I mean by that, not great cinema. It can be Sunday movies. Sunday movies many times save your life. You know, and they have mine. You know, yeah. uh, moments in my life where I'm in, in complete darkness and horror, and I, you see a Mexican melodrama with Pedro Infante, and you're lifted, or you see the right comedy, and you say, well, I'm gonna turn on the bathtub and put the razor blade. <laughs> 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 You know, go through the floor and see Citizen King. You see a, like a movie and a comedy, because I think there's much to be said in favor of uh, movies here in the theater and what they do for our lives. And, and the difficult thing is to, every decision we make, acting style, uh, camera style, light style, design, needs to work for the comedy part, for the thriller, for the musical for a melodrama, because if one of those things or the acting style of the music is off, the whole movie collapses. It's a really hard movie to, to do. I, I, I would be mortally afraid to make this movie five years ago. And what happened is, uh, to me, I've been doing this for 25 years, it's just a summation of what I have learned and a new direction. And at age 52, when I was going to finally embark on production, I did sit myself down and I said, uh, I have no problem sitting down, by the way. Ever, 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 it is and it isn't, because see, the, the, the thing with Beauty and the Beast, there are two elements that always trouble me. One is the fact that beauty has to be perfect, like a perfect princess in a little pedestal, you know, which is an impossible thing. And, and the beast has to transform into the most boring fucking prince. <laughs> Yeah. 
She is the one that makes everything happen, including saying, I'm going to take you to my bathtub, man. challenge to really do that? How did you sort of work with Sally to sort of bring that law through knowing that you would really just not have that luxury of talk? Right, right. right. Uh, well, you know, having an understanding that, uh, that humans even connect visually almost as much, if not more, than verbally, I think, um, where you, when you fall in love with someone, they're so, if they just talk to you all day and you didn't see them, uh, the love wouldn't be what it is. I think when you see someone, you see the tilt of their head, the look in their eyes, when you feel that touch, that, doesn't, that never lies. Words can deceive, words can lie, but that touch does not. And we had that together. Um, and that's something else that we learned with each other during dance rehearsal, believe it or not. And once I got the fish suit on, there was a layer of rubber between us, but, but the touch and the love was still there. <laughs> and, uh, and so much, so much happens non-verbally. Uh, we shared music together. We shared hard-boiled eggs together. We shared time together. Uh, love languages come in many, many forms. Uh, and so quality time and touch were our, were our two, I think. Well, two things that are important there is the way we constructed the script, and as I did around myself, we constructed it so that everybody that speaks, and if you see the movie again, you'll see it, it's exactly like that. Every, everybody that speaks cannot communicate. Uh, Giles cannot communicate with the blind guy. Octavia cannot communicate with her husband. Shannon wants her life in silence. Everybody cannot communicate. The ones that don't speak communicate perfectly. Wow. Because silence is very precise. And, and one thing that we did is Doug and Sally moved like they're on the water. When Sally came on board, I said to her, um, study Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, Buster Keaton, and very important, Stan Laurel from Laurel and Hardy. So Stan Laurel has a state of grace and does everything without doing anything. I said, you have to learn this because I want you to move like a silent comedian. And I want you to move in, in, in wrong ways, you know, and then dog moves the same way. You know, when they, there's a very telling moment, she pushes with her torso when she touches the glass and dog approaches the glass in the same way. And that's the moment that moves uh, Bob into action that was this is a change because he sees also that and that's another miscommunication between him and his Russian compatriots. But those are things that pepper the screenplay uh, to, to, to make this work. Yeah, I want, I want to ask also like like Dr. Robert, he's he's conflicted and, and there's uh, 
you know, between doing his job and sort of sympathizing with, with what he sees. And he's seeing something that, that no one else is really seeing, at least not until, you know, Michael Shannon sort of really uh, gets, gets involved. But like, you know, what was, it, what was it like to sort of play, play the doctor, Dr. Robert that way? And to, you know, to sort of... I think his, I think his main love was science. I think he had a big heart. I think he was stuck between two, two worlds, uh, neither of which he felt necessarily uh, uh, as accomplished as he may have been comfortable with. Uh, I think his, I think he was dazzled by this magical creature. And that was... <laughs> that, was uh, <laughs> that was something that we kind of discovered during the kitchen scene. Uh, one day there was, uh, when I'm trying to convey to my immediate superior, uh, the miracle that is this God. And uh, Guillermo pointed that out to me. And uh, we, found, we found something special that day, and we tried to write it through. One of the things this creature, the creature, not this creature, the creature. <laughs> 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 no, I wanted to represent something different for every character. Every character sees it as something. For, for Hofstetter, uh, he sees a little bit of himself in there. Not only his love for science, but they both want to go home. They're both are out of their home, yeah, out of their water, so to speak. For Octavia is the man that her friend loves. For Sally is a recognition of her own essence. For Richard is a god that can give him hair. And for Strickland is a filthy, dark thing that came from South America. And I think that each of them judges him the creature in a different way. And, and uh, at the end of the day, what the movie is about is very curious if you see it again, you will see this. Is a bunch of people that are completely alone and they don't realize it and they come together. Most of them come together. And the yeah. only one that is not alone, curiously enough, for me is Eliza. Because she has them. They don't see her. They talk to her, they talk over her, but she does see them. And that's the greatest gift. Uh, people think um, a great actor is an actor that delivers lines in a great way, but an actor, a real powerful actor, is an actor that listens and looks. And, and Sally has that gift. Tell me about the, not only the design of the amphibian god, but also wearing the costume and how it compared to other, other costumes you've worn you know, for, for, for Guillermo's movies, and also the eyes. Well, uh, let, uh, let dogs start with a uh, scale from 1 to 10. How screwed up was this? This is relatively uh, uh, gentle and kind. Um, a lot of the makeups I've worn in Guillermo's films have been five to seven hours a day of application. And, you know, that's maybe <laughs> two, two hours of, of undoing at the end of the day. Wow. This one was only three hours of application and about a half hour to get out of it. So it was really, that's... It's a walk in the park. No, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it involved, um, uh, I, I delineated... It was a sexy scuba <laughs> action. <laughs> I know you've ever seen, yeah. <laughs> um, it, was, uh, yeah it was a combination of suit and makeup. Suit slipping into, zipping up the back, makeup being actually glued down to me or painted on me um, and this was a combo of both um, uh, so but it took three people to help me shimmy into it because it was tight as you uh, could see yeah <laughs> not, not a wrinkle on that thing um, and, uh, and the, uh, the gills that you saw were, uh, were mechanically operated and puppeteered off camera um, and um, the eyes though of course were, were CG enhanced in post-production but they but the eyeballs were painted beautifully by our friend Kazu who's a brilliant artist uh, Oscar winning if I'm not crazy uh, yeah. of course, yeah. Uh, so, the eyes, uh, the, the creature, it took three years to, to do. It took two years to design, one year to develop and sculpt and paint. And we could go into boring, excruciating detail on why, but basically, you're not building a creature that is going to appear in the shadows, or you're building a living man. And that requires the range of expression of any actor. And that's very hard to achieve because you are not demanding it, you're sculpting it and painting it. And the, the eyes, uh, I wanted a physical suit. I didn't want the CG creature. I wanted a physical suit enhanced with micro gestures that we do a flinch of the cheek, uh, a wince of the eyebrow, the eye movement, the blinking was digital, but I wanted him to be there, to exist. And the painting of the eyes, 
the eyes are a very, very delicate thing because we basically construct layer by layer with acrylic. We build a, a living opal. We flock it with uh, iridescence, uh, specks of gold, layer upon layer, so there's translucency and there is depth. And then at the end, we sculpt the upper part, which is not a dome. Most people do a dome, which makes it completely fake. What we do is, if you see your eye carefully, which most makeup um, effects guys have to do, your eye is full of veins, bumps, uh, pores, and, and, and you have to make it very regular to catch the light, but the specular highlights need to be very alive, and then you add the blinking in post and all that. Before, I want to open up to the audience, because I'm sure you've got questions too, but before I do, I just want to answer you about the score, the music. Mm. Uh, which is which is which is really beautiful. I, you know, what, what, uh, was that your first sort of uh, collaboration with Alexander to go in the direction of when, or did you sort of have different? Well, I, I collaborated with Alexander in two movies: uh, Rise of the Guardians, uh, which was an animated movie at DreamWorks, and, and Troll Hunters here in the TV series on uh, Netflix. And we did he did the main themes, and I admire him to know end that. Uh, this project started in 2012, officially, in 2011, yeah. I got the idea from Daniel, we started in 2012, and in 2012 I said to Alexander, I'm making this movie, uh, and I wanted to score it, and I took him to talk about it, to a sushi restaurant. <laughs> 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 this, this is cannibalism, where he is a But the, the, precisely the grace of the creature, the one thing that is gorgeous is we designed a god, and uh, we designed the proportions to be a swimmer. Uh, the back to butt ratio was very precise. <laughs> you know, to make it majestic and beautiful. And, and, so and Alexander got a lot of inspiration from the creature and the way the camera moved. I, mean, I shot the movie like a classical movie. I started Minelli, I started uh, Douglas Sirk, I started Powell and Pressburger. I didn't study any science fiction. About for this movie. I started William Wyler. I wanted the camera on the staging to feel like a, like a musical uh, technical or beauty. And uh, Alexander got inspired by the creature and the, the camera being so fluid. And he said, the, mu the music has to be like that. And we talked about the flavor of the music. Yeah. He said, if you could name two composers, I said, George de la Rue and Nino Rota. And I said, I get it. Uh, and we tried it, and in, in his uh, studio, uh, there was one, one musical instrument that we couldn't find. He tried sax, it was horrible. He tried flute, it was too sweet. And I said, why don't you whistle? Which is something that was done a lot in the 60s. The scores, and, and, and he tried it, and it worked beautifully. Okay, who's got a question? Come on, who's got one? Anybody, anybody? Yes, right there. Nice and loud, please. When I go through my periods of larges, how do I get out of it? Well, I get out of it for sure, because otherwise I wouldn't be here, but they, you know, <laughs> you go really, you know, I think that all of us are made of different glass, you know, and we resonate with the world in a different way. And what we call normal is glass that mostly has not been broken as thick, and it can resonate with things and it doesn't get affected. But if you are a storyteller or an artist, you're made of a thinner glass, and you do crack, you know? But that's what makes you resonate with a different, in a different way. And if I may, the Japanese, among the philosophy of wabi-sabi, which is a beautiful philosophy of the beauty of imperfection, uh, one of the things they have is a thing called kintsugi, and the kintsugi is this, uh, and in old times in Japan, most of the tea sets came from China. And when they broke, because they were very expensive pieces, they were sent back to China for repair. And when they were fermented, the Chinese repairs used the staples and tried to pretend that the piece had never broken. The Japanese developed a thing that became the kintsugi, where they patched them and in the cracks, they filled the cracks with, uh, with, the pre with precious gold. Mm. 
So the piece became more desirable and beautiful because it was cracked. You could see the cracks outlined in gold. And I think that's the way you have to view yourself as a storyteller. You are Kintsugi. You're fragmented, broken, but that's what makes you you. And part of it, when you are in the darkness, you know you're about to have an insight, really. I think that those low moments precede an insight into yourself, into the world, whatever. Personally, I've been saved, my life has been saved by three movies I've made different times, Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, and this one. And, and, uh, they, they come at your darkest moment, and, you know, they become honestly painful, and honestly, you're exposing a lot of what makes you vulnerable and what scares you in the movies. But that's the only act that is valid communication, you know? I think uh, if you're not doing that, you're not doing art. You're doing something else that may be very good and all, but it's not that, you know? So just remember that, to put it in a Jungian way, the larger the talent, the larger the shadow. So they come hand in hand, and you know, you should know that it's an integral part of who you are. And it kind of saves you. Then also, call 911. I've got time for one more question right over here. Yes. Yeah, you. Hi. So, uh, thank you for existing. Um, <laughs> and then um, I just wanted to ask, like, because um, I know it's like all these different things mixed together, but did any of you have like a favorite blooper moment? Like, <laughs> did, like something happened that wasn't yeah. planned? She's asking, the, all these things are together, what do we have a blooper moment? Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you two, okay? One of Michael, one of the other Michael. But the scene where he comes to talk about, we have to stop the operation. You know, we have to do the <laughs> and Sean says, go back, close the door, knock again, protocol, right? For some fucking reason, that cracked him up so bad that every day he would go, <laughs> day 10, day 5, he never rolled. He never rolled. He was always <laughs> eternally amused by that thing. And in the movie, there's a moment where he's super angry and he goes, his blood out of his mouth moves a little. That's because he was holding his left. <laughs> it's in the movie. That's, that's one of them. The other one, uh, when we scouted the, the exterior of the, where they lived, the theater, which was uh, in a place called Massey Hall in Toronto, uh, I wanted to shoot the, the staircase that leads up doesn't connect with the other staircase. We put that in. So if you run those steps, you hit a wall. <laughs> and I wanted very much, when, when uh, Sally comes down looking for the creature, I wanted a crane that came down with her and pushed to her, with her to the ticket booth, and she sees the bloody handprint blah, blah, blah. And there was this lamppost that I couldn't, and I said, ah! And I said, well, can we do the crane from over here, from over here? And we couldn't. It was on the way, I said, okay, I'll do it with a steady cam, God damn it, I wanted the train. <laughs> the day we shoot, this movie was done, for any of you that are in the business, this movie, which looks 70 million bucks big, it was done for 19.5. And, and we, we had to pack the days really hard. And it was rain, and that day everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. Sally's at the top of the, the place, and she says, you know what, I have vertigo. You should have told me. <laughs> so when she takes those two steps, that's the only time she did it. Uh, many things happen that day. One of them is Shannon parks the car, you know. He climbs the steps, then we do what is called a Texas switch, which means when the camera tilts up, there's another guy dressed like him taking the rest of the steps because the staircase didn't connect. Take one. Shannon comes in, parks the car, guys are honking, Shannon goes up the stairs, Takes a switch, beautiful. I say, print, we don't need more. My cinematographer says, take another one. Now the cinematographers always say that. Take another one, God. He says, I say, hey, let's do it. Second take, Shannon arrives, puts the car in the park, gets out. The car is old. Parking doesn't hit. It goes to drive. 
car started rolling directly towards me. <laughs> and the video says the area. And Shannon jumps to try to change the, the speed of the bar. He's dragged by the car in the rain 20, 30 meters. The car destroys one lamppost, showers and sparks and <laughs> wire coming down like the omen. <laughs> And now I, I've never, ever, I'm 53, I've never run in my life. <laughs> ever. <laughs> never. <laughs> not for dinner, not for love, <laughs> not for death. I don't care. I can't, I have, you know, I'm the size of a small car. <laughs> so I, I can't run. I say, I'm going to die. <laughs> and, and then the car stops on the last lamppost and, and, and pff, sputters and dies, right? <laughs> I come out, everybody is suicidal. And I say, oh, the post is gone, we can do my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, just going to ask if everybody can just stay seated so uh, we can exit because we have to run to another Q&A. But make sure you spread the word about the shape of water. Go on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. MySpace, whatever.